all. Without any further delay, Yusuf Istaz is here. Jazakumullah khaira. Thank you very much for being great listeners. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulullah. Ashadu la ilaha illallah wa ashadu an muhammadin abduhu rasul. Wa salam alaikum. It's good to be here with all of you again tonight. Some of you didn't stay all night, did you? Just camp out. MashaAllah. I like that. I was listening to the program from back there. And I was thinking about what happens when people who are not Muslim hear about Islam in the media, websites, even, you know, from some people who said they had contacts with some Muslims. And I was remembering what happened when I first had the chance to meet a Muslim. How many of you heard about the story? <laughs> you already heard it? I'm not going to bother you with it again. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Do we have anybody here tonight that's a Muslim? Where are the Muslims at? Where are they? If the angels came right now and wanted to know who's the Muslims, who'd raise their hand? Let's see. Huh? Hello. Okay. Do we have anybody here that's not a Muslim yet? <laughs> You already got the beard, man. I said, you're good to go. <laughs> How about over here? Huh? Give it. <laughs> Close. And when people hear the story of what some Muslims do, and then this, of course, has to be exaggerated a little bit, then we find some you know, pretty rotten stories that come around. And just the other day, right here in Australia, there was a chance for me to interview some people. I like to do that man on the street thing with the camera and go around and ask the people, well, have you heard about Islam? What do you know about Muslims? Have you ever seen any of those programs where they do that? And you listen to people's responses. Some of them are hysterical. Now, some of them you'd be surprised that, it, that a person, not Muslim, will say, oh, Islam, well, Islam you have to do uh, something called shahada. Then they have to do prayer five times a day. And they go down the list and you're like, whoa, all right. And then others will say, Islam. I remember one time I asked somebody, I said, uh, have you heard of Islam? He's thinking, thinking. I said, you know, Islam. He said, is that a salad dressing? <laughs> I'm like, what? But, you know, so you have everything in between. But then there are those that have a really bad notion about Islam and it's fair because if that's all they know, that's all they know. But it should be that after somebody is dealing with Muslims, even for a short period of time, that they'd have a pretty good impression of Islam and what the Muslims are about. But as we just heard a few minutes ago, sometimes some of the Muslims are pretty tough and not so good. And then that leaves a bad impression for all the rest of us. We do have, according to the Catholic Church's latest release, for whatever that's worth, we do have the distinction now of being the largest religion in the world. That's according to the Catholic Church. Islam is to them the largest of all the religions on earth. We passed them up, they said, in the last census. You don't look excited. <laughs> It doesn't really matter, does it? Does it? If we have one more or one less Muslim out of one and a half or two billion people, I can't tell the difference. You can't tell the difference. But it makes a lot of difference how the Muslims we have behave. 
the akhlaq of the Muslim is really what it's all about. The behavior, the manners, the way of the Muslim. When we talk about the people of the West, so-called West, and the so-called East, so-called Middle East, there will always be cultural difference, and there's going to be traditions that some tribes and people have that will separate them from the other people. But when we start talking about religion, all, most religions have something that are that kind of leans toward their own area. For instance, Hindus obviously are going to be basically from India. Why? Well, that's really the name. It's not really India. It's Hindustan, and their religion's named after the place. That's Hinduism. Christianity is not exactly the same way, though, because it does have adherence from all of the population of the world. Judaism, on the other hand, is pretty strict. If you want to be a real Jew, you have to be born under the tribe of Judah. So the only way you can really join is get a blood transfusion from somebody that's <laughs> from there, if you want to go by that. And then Buddhism is just limited, really, to uh, certain areas. Some people are attracted to it, but what about Islam? Islam claims to be for all places and all people and all times. This is the claim in Islam. Because I grew up with a Christian background, I can speak from that to the extent, at least for the first 50 years, and tell you that I definitely saw, whether they will ever admit it or not, prejudice. Because even today, we have Christian churches that are for Chinese and Christian churches for Japanese. And we have Christian churches for black people, Christian churches for Mexican people, even though they speak English. But wouldn't it be strange to you and I if somebody said, oh, don't go to that mosque over there because that's black people? Because any masjid in the world could have a black person as the imam, or a white person, or a yellow person, or any color person, and we wouldn't think about it, would we? <laughs> All we want to know is can he recite the Quran correctly? That would be the main thing. When Malcolm X was re close to real Islam, you know he used to be in the nation of Islam, but when he came to real Islam, that was one of the things that struck him because he had gone for Hajj. And he was amazed. He said, you'd be praying right next to a white person. And uh, blacks and browns and all the colors, all, you know, all together. He was amazed. He talked about it. One of the things he said was that when he did Salah in some small masjid, in, in Mecca, they weren't actually at the big haram, they were in a small masjid. He said that he noticed that the one leading was probably from Africa, but he was black. And so he went to him after the prayer and he said, did you ever think you'd have a chance to be leading prayer in front of all these white guys? <laughs> he said, the man looked at him and said, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? Because of the stigma the thing that he grew up in, in his mentality, this was a big deal, you know? To try to finally get a chance to be up at level with Whitey. That's what he talked about. And I watched, the, uh, by the way, I used to be white. Uh, <laughs> I tried to keep a straight face. I couldn't. <laughs> but I used to watch. When I was real little, I, I watched my cousins, you know. 
And they were telling me something one time about coloreds. And I, and I was thinking, color, you know, color. At that time was a big deal because movies were black and white. What television there was, and there weren't that many TVs around, they were all black and white, but there was something new out called Technicolor. This is a big deal. Tadeo, Technicolor, and it was something called Buena Vista, which is a part of Disney for the animal things, kind of like the, the early version of Animal Planet, okay, that they had in the movie house, and it was in color, Technicolor. So he started talking about he with his friends about we're going to see some coloreds today, colored people. And I was thinking, wow, like rainbows or something, I'm imagining. I have no idea what they were talking about until we were going down the, to the beach and they had a big sign up, no coloreds. And I'm thinking, why can't you have any color on the beach? I don't get it. This is 1940s and it was so bad that people took it for granted and it was all right. But still, little kids, they don't get this. They don't really see that because they start out innocent. We mentioned that last night, that when children are born, they're in a state of innocence, not a state of guilt, you know. And so they don't perceive this, this horrible thing. In Arabic, you've got something that extends over into tribalism and, and bipartisanism. It's called asabiya. And this is... Worse than that. It's something horrible. And so we were now making a migration from up north to Texas. I remember that. And on the way, we stopped in a place called Arkansas. When we stopped in the gas station, my dad told the kids, said, go back there, you guys use the bathroom, come on, and we're going to go. You know how it would be. Well, my, my sisters got the ladies, girls, you know, and somebody else had the men's, and I kept going, and they said, colored. I said, yeah, colored. That's going to be great, you know. I wanted to see what a colored bathroom looked like inside. <laughs> I could imagine that was going to be something. And when I come out of it, I said, ah, not that great of a bathroom, you know. <laughs> and some guy saw me come and said, what did you go in there for? I didn't want to tell him, you know. <laughs> I used the bathroom. He said, no, that's for colored. I didn't get it. But even though we've been through a lot in our country and we've seen busing taking the black children to the white areas, white children to the black areas, they spent all of our Social Security money to do it. All the reserve for Social Security, they used it up for that. In the 60s, it got really bad, and then it got to the point where we had some very serious violence. And when Martin Luther King, Jr., was given a speech, he said that he had a dream, and his dream was to see the children all together, growing up together, going to school together. That was a dream that he had, and he said that. Right after that, they assassinated him. They killed him. This is the kind of hatred that comes with that. For what? For the color of his skin? Can you imagine that? And you might think that that's all over with. We don't have that problem. No. What it does, it just goes deeper. It hides its head down low, you know, under the radar. But it's still there. If you doubt what I said, and it extends beyond just the white-black thing, it's also a man-woman thing. You know, in the West, they still have a problem with women holding high position. You believe that? How come Hillary Clinton is out of the race? Hmm? Because and we'll watch what happens now with Obama when he goes up against McCain. McCain is what? What color? Real white. <laughs> we'll see. I could be wrong. I've been wrong before. We'll see. 
The point that I'm trying to get at really is how much the West really